Welcome. We're very excited of this new joint webinar series by Coventry Universities and EBN. Uh, it's the first of a series that we will be hosting this year um, on extended reality solutions for different kind of industries. Today, we will be focusing on creative industries. Uh, as mentioned, this is the first edition of the webinar series, and we'll bring together the XR industry in its broadest sense, which means as well academia players for mostly, of course, Coventry here as the main partner, but as well startups, corporates, and business support uh, communities and actors. Today, we're gonna to dive a bit deeper in the potential of XR and AR and immersive strategies and showcase you how you can unlock new business opportunities and learning opportunities in the creative industry sectors. At the same time, oh, thank you, see that Magdalena is already letting people in. Um, I will introduce Magdalena in a second. My name is Bram Powell, I'm a Chief Strategy Officer at EBN. Thank you for joining. Um, with us today, we have quite an impressive lineup of speakers. So, the first and foremost, uh, co host from Coventry University Enterprise in the Brussels Hub, our neighbors here in uh, TBN, uh, Magdalena Pajolska, Enterprise and Innovation Manager. For the rest, we have, uh, we're very curious to hear from them later on, Dr. Bianca Wright, Associate Professor and Curriculum Lead Immersive at Coventry University as well award-winning tech journalist. We have Dr. Sean Heights, Academic Dean uh, of the Arts and Humanities, uh, faculty at Coventry University. Simon Wright, co-founder of CX Ninjas. Nice to meet you, Simon. And, and Grant Spencer, Director of Wireframe Extended Reality. So indeed, two startups, or two companies, and um, the two partners from Coventry. Uniquely for you joining us today, we'll, with the partners, um, and of course, for the Coventry partners and for the EU BICS, the members of, of EBN, uh, our experts will showcase ideas, experiences, and innovative solutions utilizing cutting edge immersive technology and applications. As I said, the meeting is being recorded. So if you have any objection, please uh, turn off your camera. For the rest, I would like to invite you to, uh, to turn up your camera as much as possible. As you can see, we're in a Zoom meeting environment. So let's keep this as interactive as possible. It's uh, far from being a webinar. That also means indeed, and I'm very happy to see everybody using the chat. Feel free to place your questions in the chat or to raise your hand if you have an immediate question. We will see if we can deal with it on the spot uh, or if the presentation is still ongoing. Of course, we give the speakers some time to finish their presentation. Bottom line, we'll be very happy to answer all your questions and to introduce you and connect you in the conversation. What is ahead of us? A quick, it's, it's basically very simple. We have a very quick introduction of EBN, two to three minutes. We have a quick introduction of Coventry, two to three minutes. And then we're very happy to give the floor to uh, Bianca, Sean, Simon and Gren. We'll explain what they've been doing at, uh, at Coventry and the use cases they will provide us with. As, inspirational cases to learn from. In the end, uh, depending a bit on how we go in terms of questions, we'll have a Q&A section, a session of 10 minutes roughly. Um, as to remind you again, feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat already and perhaps we can deal with them on the spots. EBN uh, serves people that use business and innovation uh, as a force for regional, economic, sustainable and social development through entrepreneurial innovation. That means we support innovation ecosystem builders and we support startups, our members support startups. Our members are typically recognizable through their excellent performance. And I'm always very proud to say that. Um, it's not EBN that does it, it really is the members uh, and the community that facilitates this performance and the EU BIC quality certification. We connect all the EU BICs through the EU BIC community. The certified EU BICs, as you can see, they're quite a bit all over Europe on the slide. Um, they use the best possible actions to thrive, to create thriving startups and SMEs, working in all kinds of industries, ranging from space and deep tech, uh, AI to medtech to agri-food and smart materials. One key feature of EU BICs, and I'm proud to say that Coventry is one of us, our members of course as well, so that counts to more uh, for Coventry as well. Uh, They're taking real steps to ensure that their services are best advantageous to their clients. And at the same time, also best advantageous for the regions and for the cities they operate in, and of course the people that live there. As you can see, there are roughly 160 
five members uh, as of 2022. We count this every year. These are certified EU BICs, but also associate members and partners. Um, and over 35 countries together, we shape the global EU BIC community. And most of our members, if I need to uh, give a topology of them, there, there would be accelerators, incubators, uh, science parks, and of course, academia with, with entrepreneurship centers uh, and technology transfer organizations. Our members typically unite around four mission commitments. Um, as diverse as they already commit to those four missions, uh, regional economic, sustainable economic development, delivering best quality business support, which works. We can see that indeed uniting them in a community and providing sharing tools and best practices really uh, increases the survival rates of startups that are being supported by our members. Uh, the outperform in first and five year survival rates uh, compared to EU average. Third mission, providing access to finance and fourth, scaling European innovation, of course, in the broadest sense and global innovation. Briefly, before I hand over to uh, Magdalena about EBN, uh, because this is all about the EBN community, EBN facilitates and supports this rich pan European global community of people that use innovative business as a driver for regional sustainable economic development. Um, EBN hosts different services to facilitate this and to realize this. Uh, as said, the EU Big Certification hosts a series of training as well. Um, we co-design and distribute quality business support programs. Together, we uh, implement various EU projects. We provide technical assistance to emerging innovation ecosystems, can be in Europe, CEE, can be in uh, Africa, can be in China, can be in all parts of the world. And finally, of course, um, we do a bit of advocacy as well through strategic partnerships uh, for our members. In this context, EBN, and thank you, Coventry, and the speakers for joining us. Uh, the EU big community of members and our partners, we are very pleased to collaborate with, uh, with Coventry University on this, on this webinar and in the many other uh, collaborations that we have, making Europe and the UK the hub for solving our global challenges, powered by research, innovation, technology, and ingenuity of entrepreneurial innovators. And on that note, I would like to give the word to Magdalena. Please introduce yourself and tell us more about Coventry. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the Joint Covent University EBN webinars on extended reality solutions. The first one kicking off on creative industries, the metaverse, XR, digital media. My name is Magdalena Pacholska. I'm a neighbor also of EBN. Our office is just in front of EBN. I'm here as an enterprise innovation manager um, of uh, Coventry University Brussels Hub. So my introduction will be very short. Uh, because of course, Sean and Bianca and Simon and Grant, they are the stars of this, of this webinar. But uh, before they speak, I would like to give you a very quick overview of, of our Coventry University Education Group, which provides uh, education to over 50,000 students all around the globe. So um, Coventry University first was created as a college of design in 1843. So it's uh, almost 200 years old. Uh, we became a polytechnic in 1970, and then in 1992, we became Coventry University as it is now. Uh, while you can see on this one slide our selected uh, favorite accolades and ranking results, uh, I wish to explain to you very, very briefly the four themes of our 2030 group strategy. That, of course, our, uh, our aim is to always strive to improve on, uh, on, on those numbers and on those rankings and excel at the, at the educational offer that we are providing and, and, of course, research offer. So the first theme is education and student experience. Uh, by this, we aim to deliver um, education that transforms the lives and advances society. Our origins in the industrial city of Coventry um, remind us of our that our educational offer has to serve the need and reflect the needs and aspirations of our students and their future employers and our partners. Uh, the second theme is research and impact. Um, our research is designed to meet societal and economic needs and, at, and to address real, uh, real world challenges. It's, um, it's a challenge led and transdisciplinary research and innovation that we are very proud of. The third theme of our group strategy is enterprise innovation from the pillar where I work. 
At Coventry, as uh, enterprise innovation, we mean realizing innovation and commercializing our knowledge and insights. Our, in our engagement with businesses, like the ones that are presenting today, together at the webinar, um, so this engagement and be, with business and community is designed to support the economic development, first and foremost, uh, as well as local growth and regeneration. Um, last but not least, and again, speaking to you from the European Hub, uh, Brussels uh, Hub Europe, the fourth team is Global University. We are a globally orientated university uh, providing and operating at a global scale. Our growing network of hubs uh, in Asia, um, Africa, Europe, and in the Middle East provide a valuable presence in our key global markets. Uh, I hope that this will this session will provide you really very enriching content and inspiration for collaboration with us. And please contact us for whatever sort of collaboration your business or your organization uh, would like to would like to um, uh, start with us or discuss with us either in the educational or in the research-related um, uh, domains. And now I give uh, the floor back to Bram, our Master of Ceremony, and wishing um, you all enjoying uh, to, to an enjoyment of this, of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magdalena. I tampered a bit with your slides, as you can see. Um, the final session already announced. The next session is around March 1, tentatively, so keep an eye on that. Just to Reemphasize this is a series of webinars covering different industries. But first, let's have a look at the creative industries. Um, Bianca, Sean, I will stop sharing. Feel free to pull up your slides. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sean Hydes. I'm with my colleague Bianca Wright, and obviously, as you've heard, you're going to hear from both Gren and Simon as we go through this presentation. Um, my job here is to sort of set the scene and to provide a bit of context. Um, it's been very important for us to get into the field of extended reality, AR, VR, at a number of levels, but with a sort of set of strategic purposes. And those have to be informed very closely by the fact that we are a faculty of arts and humanities that bring together a series of disciplines in art and design, media and performing arts, and in the humanities. And we, a key thing for us is to define what that immersive territory should look like. We are not about teaching about those subjects. We are trying to find ways to teach through um, these technologies and to teach through immersive experience in collaboration with, um, uh, with partners across the university and other faculties, but also particularly with partners from outside the organization. And the key to that is finding meaningful ways to tell stories um, through those technologies in new ways. Um, a key aspiration for us is how we build a, a, the talent pool and the talent pipeline for future employability, self-employment and as employees, and also to work across those technologies, but in different ways. Um, you know, if we are not experimental and playful in the ways that we work, then we're not really doing what, what we're here to do. So a key thing for us is that we adopted um, a very broad definition of immersive. So for us, immersive means things that we run through particular technologies like AR, VR, XR, and 3D motion capture, projection mapping, a whole series of things. But it's technology, it's sorry, it's conceptually much bigger than the, than the, than the technological approaches. So we are interested in the idea of immersion as a metaphor and a concept for how we engage with all our educational practices at every level. So it is about the creative application of technologies, in particular the ones that you see here, but it goes way beyond that. At the moment, we're on a transition. We are working our way into these spaces in new ways. Um, the situation was that we had very focused pockets of activity in extended reality and immersive technologies. And um, a key aspiration for us at this moment is to unify and exemplify how we work in what my colleague Bianca has um, <laughs> characterized as a digital space, um, which breaks the boundaries between the physical and the digital, and how we are going to work with a complex array of tools and technologies, but through this cohesive um, strategy in a, in a teaching learning environment that's driven by enterprise and collaboration. So that 
um, approach is um, encapsulated in a new set of spaces that we are just in the business of building, which is going to be called the Delia Derbyshire Building, which will open later this year. And we're also trying to um, be sensitive to the kinds of um, unexpected learning, I think, that we've acquired through the challenges that we've gone through in the last three years with the global pandemic, but also this aspiration of the university to be global. That gives us a set of opportunities and a set of real and dynamic challenges. Um, so oops. the building, as I say, will be um, opening in a series of phases. Um, we're already partly into the space that you've got um, in the visual here, which is the new part of the Delia Derbyshire building. Um, that contains very specific and dedicated technologies to new immersive studios, um, which Gren is helping us with, and you'll hear a little bit more about very shortly, but also a couple of hack labs, um, a huge hyper studio that's intended to give us the ability to work in transdisciplinary ways with students from engineering and health and life sciences and with industry partners from right across the region nationally and internationally. Um, so just to give you that flavor that this uh, um, immersive agenda for us is about working with immersive technologies in a very focused way. It's about teaching our students how to employ and engage with those technologies, but it's also about how we mobilize those technologies in conventional teaching and learning environments. So some of the most interesting ideas we've um, encountered so far have actually come from our School of Humanities, who've come up with some brilliant ways of doing storytelling in new ways through, um, through extended reality and AR and VR technologies, and also how to um, give that sense of immersion to students that would normally be studying fairly um, conventional and traditional academic subjects. How do we make that learning experience immersive for them? The last way, as I say, is that this then gives us a prompt, this, these, these particular approaches give us a prompt to try to make all our learning experiences immersive. So even those that involve almost no technology at all, we're extending that sense of immersive to those experiences such that something that's very performative and it's about physical embodiment, how do we understand how that is an immersive experience for the learner and maybe for the audiences that are participating in say a show or a workshop or a, or a practical creative activity. So at each of those levels, specifically about technologies, specifically teaching students about technologies, teaching through technologies and in the very idea of an immersive experience. We're trying to embody and implement all of those ideas in the physical layout um, and the way that we've developed um, a, a new set of facilities and a new set of uh, a new building for us to, uh, to, to expand our provision into. And um, one of the ways that we've begun to do that is, again, a very new way of working for us that we're using a set of uh, challenge-based projects with cross-disciplinary teams in the faculty who each will be exploring one of these new spaces because they're spaces they've not encountered before. So there's a project that will exploit the capabilities of the hack lab and the hack approaches. There's a project that's looking at the hyper studio and how the hyper studio can mobilize a different set of ways of working. And lastly, a project which will explore and expand what we can do in our immersive studios, even before we've got them. So a key thought for us is that we need to be testing out these very new approaches with our existing um, staff teams and our existing students just to begin to change mindsets, because it feels like the change of mindset and the change of approach is every bit as important, if not more important than the accomplishment of the actual physical spaces. So as you can see, it's not just what we make, but it's how it's made. And it's what we learn in the process of trying to make in new ways. To give you one very concrete and perhaps seemingly simple um, example, these new spaces will not be timetabled. People will get access to them for a program of activity and work. Now that in your world might be perfectly normal. But a higher education institution tends to be a very timetabled space. So the intersection between very timetabled, very scheduled, very rigid sequences of teaching and learning activities against a program of activities in some shared space, that's a very big transition for us to make. And we're learning a lot as we go through that transition um, and, and, and understanding how we can mobilize 
um, these new spaces and new ways of working alongside existing practices and indeed to transition from one to the other in a kind of we hope relatively organized but creative and exciting and experimental way um our next big project after that, and this is very ambitious, mm -hmm. is that we would like to move from exploring these, um, exploring extended reality inside our existing physical spaces to look at the idea of uh, maybe a smart factory or a meta building. So the idea that we're going to explore next is looking at how um, the digital presence of our space. So obviously we've just gone through a redevelopment plan. We have an entire digital model um, as courtesy of our, of our architects who designed the buildings. And we're looking at flipping that from being the plan to being a space in which we can interact with colleagues internationally, globally, um, because we can all be in that digital space um, on equal footing, on equal terms. So rather than having those challenges of who's in the room and who has to engage remotely, we would all be engaged in this in this third space, uh, the meta building or, or the smart faculty. It's being called lots of different things at the minute. So we're just, again, beginning to explore how we will get into that kind of space and how we'll be able to embody it. And our partners, um, not least Gren, are, are part of how we are uh, looking to move into that space. I think that hopefully segues neatly into, into Gren's section of the presentation. I'm going to hand over to him. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Glenn Spencer. Um, I'm director of Wireframe XR. Um, so for the last three years now, we've been designing and specifying the two immersive studios at Coventry University and are about to install the designs into the new Delia Derbyshire building. Um, so I'm going to very, very briefly just take you through some of the capabilities um, of the studios and our design and installation process um, utilising the wireframe. Could you next slide if you would, please? Um, so we've been designing the two spaces for Coventry University. One is a, a visual capture creation and editing suite, and, and one is more of an immersive audio studio, obviously with the two working in parallel together. Uh, both of the new immersive studios at Coventry University, are, are, they're designed with a multi, multidisciplinary disciplinary approach. Um, it's obviously really important because we needed to enable so many different disciplines from you know, fashion and textiles, automotive, um, whatever it may be. Um, but to enable students and faculty to bring their data into the system, to meet, to collaborate, to design, and then, of course, output something meaningful. Well, whilst this is all great fun, um, I'm a big proponent of obviously making good use of this technology rather than, than just sort of hanging around the buzzwords and, and, and finding this uh, a great laugh. Um, so this is it's obviously really important. Um, we also need to do this whilst making the spaces mirror the hardware and, and processes, processes that the industry would use um, to enable students then to, to move out of their education and into an industry where things still make sense in a, in a technological sense. So um, we ran several workshops at university to enable faculty to fire ideas at us, questions, concerns, um, and these workshops, and a lot came from this, um, new ideas, new use cases that we hadn't previously thought of. Um, and then this obviously took time to implement and make possible um, and of, of course, make, make these things useful. So starting briefly with the capture space, uh, next, next slide, please, if you would. Um, I won't go into too much detail about the hardware, just to give you some sort of idea of what these studios are about. So the space compromises uh, a Vicon motion, motion tracking system, uh, which is an industry leading tracking system used on many high budget films and, and productions. Um, the tracking system obviously links perfectly with virtual and augmented reality, so if required, you can not only do uh, perform motion capture as you would normally for for a game or for a film, but you can also inhabit full body avatars, and then have these avatars uh, collaborative, remotely collaborative with different teams in different locations, and uh, and do everything that that kind of comes with that. We found this really obviously very useful in things like automotive, um, which we've worked with the National Automotive Innovation Center at Warwick University, Jaguar Land Rover, McLaren, implementing some of these systems, coming up with ideas as well, because as we all know, these things are quite new um, and coming up with new use cases. Um, one example being sort of ergonomic tests for, for new cars, uh, that kind of thing. Um, in the space, we're also making a good use of a variety of 360 cameras 
Um, so also live recording of monoscopic stereoscopic video, um, the capture, editing and publication uh, of, of that data as well. Um, we're also enabling students, of course, to create in various 3D packages, but we're, we're also honing in on sort of Unreal and Unity uh, game engine development for virtual production, for games, for big budget films, for that kind of thing. Uh, next slide, please, if you would. Um, space will also enable us um, to make good use of photogrammetry capture, uh, editing and publishing. Uh, the bringing in of all this data and the capability of designing, editing and making full use of, of these capabilities as well. Um, in cyberspaces, we're also able to uh, do video editing and the creation of video um, and both spaces will work together, obviously the audio and the, um, and the immersive uh, visual studio. Uh, next slide, please, if you would. Just say a little bit about, oh, I'll, I'm ahead of myself. I'll just say a little bit about the audio space. The audio space um, comprises of a 10.4.1 Genelec speaker system um, with a centralized bespoke um, uh, mixing console, uh, specially built for the design, the recording and mixing of immersive sound for immersive applications. Uh, this is a Dolby Atmos surround sound system. So we can create and mix a variety of output standards on a variety of platforms, Cubase, Pro Tools, et cetera. <laughs> Um, so I'll stay on this slide. What is the wireframe? It's not only a company, it's also uh, an application, but also a process as well. So just very briefly, um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this brief. I uh, founded the wireframe as a project in 2011, uh, just before the release of the Oculus development kit. Um, we were sort of totally determined to visualize a 3D internet. We're, we're hearing a lot about this now um, in, various, in various guises. Um, I'm still not convinced by a lot of it and, and some of it has very limited use. So we, we wanted to, to always bring in the functionality of well, useful, useful tools into this space. Um, so we, we sort of, after some dalliances in sort of OpenSIM and Hypergrid, we moved on to Unity and started writing our own back end for our, our sort of vision of the matrix, if you will. Um, but this actually quickly turned into a viable design and we were um, only implementing, as I said, useful or required sort of functionality rather than just firing things in that were aesthetically pleasing. So very briefly, what is it? Um, Wireframe is a framework that's draped over and around the planet, sort of linking VR and AR together in a geolocated one-to-one -one scale space. Um, we'll then also be able to bring in CAD photogrammetry, um, all kinds of 3D laser scans, that kind of thing, and enable interaction, collaboration. We then um, start to implement some of the remote working stuff when we, when we could. And um, um, we try and bring in every element of a task and make it available in world. So a, a lot of our stuff is, is bespoke, exactly the same with, what, with the idea of what we've, designed and, and currently installing for, for the university. Um, next slide, please, if you would. Um, so at the beginning of our design process, digital twins are created um, of the proposed spaces. We might use photogrammetry or hand build the spaces in 3D, um, or of course, utilize the client's design CAD and bring that into the wireframe. And then we can all meet in the space uh, in VR and start our collaborative design process, which for me is always the most exciting. Um, the slide that you see now is a good example of um, a ride that we put together for Mellows Group, which was done exactly the same way. A collaborative space was put together and um, eventually it is putting together um, a ride on the end of a KUKA robot arm, which is quite complex together. But we, we all our engineers met um, inside the space um, and we started to simulate the processes and make changes collaboratively, that kind of thing. Um, this has been very useful for people like Triumph Motorcycles, Jaguar Land Rover and others. Um, this digital twin that everybody was talking about, we start to put together a very useful version of that for them um, to enable things like designing of factory floors, um, the changing of those. You can even run through sort of two or three hours of sort of fake virtual work, if you like, and, and find out where all your pain points are and then make some informed decisions based on that, which is great. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to installation, our engineers already feel that they've been on site already. They, they, they know the layout, they know the plan, they've, they've run, run through many elements of the installation process uh, uh, many times. Uh, next slide, if you would. So collaborative design. So, I mean, it's one of the more beautiful parts of the idea of a metaverse is it is true collaboration. Um, collaboration between users on multiple flat platforms and in different locations. Um, some of the metaverse style applications available today kind of fall short on this functionality and 
it's great to just meet up in VR fine and throw something at your colleague, but, but that kind of then what, you know, like you, you, you need to make these things useful. And that's what we've always strived for. Um, it, the wireframe it enables the user to collaborate in VR, AR remotely on site, and of course off site and cl collaborate via a, a standard sort of desktop uh, application. Uh, next and last slide, I believe. So I'll, I'm going to skip over the often used buzzwords because I hate that. And I'll, I'll just say that this way of creating has obviously really, really worked for us uh, because as a company, we, we utilize the very same tools and processes that we are installing for our clients and, and they both expand with each other. Um, so as we know, the technology is still really, it's in its infancy in many ways and, and the functionality is going to expand quite, quite quickly. So we're very proud to be at the cutting edge of this with Coventry University and, and the rest of the, the, the wireframe developed uh, sites. Um, this is a very, very brief uh, introduction into the, the immersive studios and the wireframe process. If you have any further questions, please, please, please get in touch and I'll uh, give my balance of time to the uh, Q&A session. Um, thank you, Gwen. Um, so hello everybody, my name is Bianca Wright, I am the Curriculum Lead for Immersive in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and um, my role is really to look at the ways in which we work uh, across the faculty in terms of immersive and to work very closely with Sean in developing the strategy for the faculty. Um, so before we uh, introduce Simon Wright from CX Ninjas, I just wanted to quickly uh, set the scene in terms of some of the different ways that we work with industry. Um, with, with students and with staff across the university and more particularly in terms of how we work as a faculty. So um, our collaboration uh, with Gren and with Wireframe XR has really been about exchanging knowledge and, and having Gren really facilitate um, and support the understanding of our staff um, and ourselves in terms of the way that we want to go. And as has already been outlined, we are both excited and somewhat skeptical of a lot of the buzz uh, terminology that goes out into industry in different ways but what we are interested in is what can we do with new and emerging technologies um, that will allow us to support students, staff, and of course our partners and collaborators in various ways. Um, so that may mean um, providing opportunities for uh, companies, big and small, to work with student groups on challenge projects, to do rapid prototyping, uh, but also to do things like uh, being collaborative test bed um, uh, sort of accelerators for organizations to test out ideas, um, to try things. We're very open to experimentation. Um, we also look, of course, uh, with a view to future workforce, to providing professional uh, development training and to embedding that within our existing educational offer. Um, so our partnership with, uh, with Gren has been very much about um, where we're going in terms of our immersive strategy and about the infrastructure that we're developing, but also our ways of working. Uh, when we look at how we work with students, we're going to focus on a particular project um, that we worked on, which is uh, the Genesis Creators Program. So I'm going to, hopefully this video is going to play, um, I'm going to uh, play a little extract from a video that was part of the Creators Program. Uh, Genesis, if you don't know, is a multinational customer service um, uh, customer experience organization um, that works in contact centers, but also live chat and various other um, aspects and um, worked with us on a rapid prototyping project specifically. So this is one of the outputs that the students work. <laughs> The Genesis Creators Programme is a showcase of talent and innovation that challenges students to imagine the future in a range of sectors, explore how to use Genesis tools and other technologies to create memorable customer experiences, and showcase their ideas and skills to partners, customers and Genesis itself. From an initial cohort of just five creators in our first iteration, the program has yielded a number of successes, including the development of three prototype applications for different clients, demos at CX Summit in London and Experience 19 in Denver, the recruitment of several of our creators by one of Genesis partners, Anana, and now our showcase of the latest projects in the program.
Our creators come from a range of different geographies and backgrounds and draw on their studies and the additional support and training they receive from the Creators Program to apply their skills in new and interesting ways. Tyrus Clayton. Okay, uh, apologies, I think I've gone too far there. Um, I'm going to um, hand over to Simon right now. So Simon is uh, has worked with us for a long period of time, both in his uh, former role and now um, very excitingly in his role at, with CX Ninja, a company that he's just founded. So uh, Simon, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Bianca. Um, so I'm sure some of you or most of you are, are thinking, I do not look, look like a ninja. <laughs> Um, well, the, uh, the the name is a little bit misleading um, in the sense that uh, what we do is we look at everything around CX, which is customer experience. And that indeed is also what Genesis do. And my role at Genesis up until the end of last year, which is when I left to create um, before launch CX Ninjas, was to um, uh, launch and, and run the creator program, um, which uh, started off. Uh, about four or five years ago now as a um, as a bit of a pilot to see could we inspire the next generation of young person to work in our in our world of customer experience and what could those new people what are the new younger minds do with some of the new technology that was emerging at the time including augmented and virtual and mixed reality um, so I had the probably the best job in the world um, of um, putting together um, some fabulously creative, talented students from Coventry University with some of the biggest brand names in the world, like Uber and eBay and, and others, um, uh, to see uh, and, and sort of see what, what they would create, what would, they would invent with some of these new technologies. Um, so the program itself um, is, is continuing, um, even though I've left Genesis, it's continuing to run. And, and in fact, in my role at, in, in Ninjas, we're now continuing to work with the university and, and have actually started to engage some of their students to help us with the work that we're doing now in, in the world of CX. Um, but the, the program itself um, is all about giving young people the opportunity to get experience um, in industry. So um, what uh, the way it worked was that uh, students would be recruited from uh, as undergraduates from digital media or computing science or, or other um, courses they were doing at the time and invited to take part in the program um, running alongside their existing studies. So this was a sort of it wasn't an out of school club, but it was it was something that would augment or, or um, complement what they were doing. So if they're a digital media student, obviously they've got great skills that could could work in in the design and creation of a new of a new app, for example, or in a go to market plan for a new product. Um, so um, the students would be recruited at sort of the September time to the beginning of the academic year, and then they would be challenged by one of Genesis's customers to build and design and, and create and invent an experience of the future using whatever technology they wanted to they wanted to use. Um, and those experiences could be anything. Um, it could be something that they as a, as a young person would want. It could be something um, to to help potentially um, uh, disabled people. It could be something to help with um, people from who, who were visiting from another country and didn't speak the language. It could be something that, that were, was eco friendly, that was that could be good for the planet. Um, but the 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 uh, the remit was that it had to be uh, a, a real enough that they could prototype it. So it couldn't just be all a vision where it had to be something that they would then go and build as a team, um, code, develop, actually create something and demonstrate it to Genesis customers um, uh, as part of the program. So they would get all that incredible experience. Um, and if you move on to the next slide. Um, Bianca. Um, and uh, it runs uh, over about three or four months. It starts off with the students coming together as a team and thinking about who they're going to work with. So just like a sort of a mini startup, you would have a mix of uh, students who are more design focused, working with computer science coding type people 
who might also work with uh, people who are more confident presenting, who would also be being part of the team. So it'd be like a, like a mini company. Um, they would then get a challenge from one of the customers. And as I said, over the years, those customers have included um, eBay and Uber, um, who would then, they record a video and present the video as a challenge to the students. Um, the students would then go away, led by Bianca and her wonderful team at Coventry, and, and come up with a, with a plan and create a long list of ideas in response to the customer challenge. They presented the ideas to the customer. The customer then said, hey, I like the look of those two or three as a short list. And then they would go away as a team again or in different teams and actually build out their ideas into a demo. And we're gonna have a look at one of those demos in a moment. Uh, then at the end of the program, uh, they would present a live to the customers. Um, and I have to tell you that the presentation moment doing live presentations of young students to some of the top brand names in the world was one of the scariest moments of my life. <laughs> um, and but and uh, you never quite knew what was going to happen. Um, but the the customers loved it. And, and when I say, you know, presented to the customers, I mean, the very top head of technology at Uber, or head of customer experience at eBay. So these were very, very senior people um, and just got that incredible experience in the process. Um, and at the end of the program, I'm really pleased to say, and, and I hope it will continue, um, some of the, the students in the program went on to find employment in, in our industry of customer experience, either with partners or, or we hope with customers in the future. And as I said, I'm actually working with some of those students now in, in my new role at Ninjas. Um, so it, it is a true partnership, um, and it's. I think I hope it, it will be a model for the future with other companies in indus other industry partners who will work with universities in this way, um, because not only does it give them a chance to to get that experience of actually presenting to to in, in the corporate world and building and, and uh, presenting to customers, but it also um, is a great talent pool. It's a great way to recruit and, and train at the same time the next generation of, of, of person who, who might work, work in your industry or even in your company. Um, so um, if we move on to the next slide, Bianca, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at one of the, uh, one of the projects. This was actually presented um, uh, to some of our customers in London, or Genesis customers, should I say, uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, and a, as per usual, sorry, Simon, the uh, technology is not cooperating, even though it did earlier. Oh, the video, is it? Is yeah, the video the is not I'm not going to have to describe all of it, am I? <laughs> um, no, no. But maybe just give a, a brief sort of summary of, of what the... Okay. What, uh, Genesis well, we'll have to leave you wanting apologies. more then. We'll have to leave you wanting more. But basically, the, uh, the students created a working augmented reality app that would um, allow a shopper... Uh, to walk around a retail store or a shop and use uh, the AR to um, give information on the products they were looking at on the shelves. So it would it would scan the product or the barcode, whatever it was, and it would pop up information about, about the product. And, and really, the, the really interesting thing about that was, for example, allergy advice. So it gives some information about allergies. It would um, also uh, perhaps give some information about uh, uh, recipes. So, hey, this product will be great for this type of recipe. Do you want to know more? Press here. Um, and then the thing that, that I really liked of this project was they also came up with the idea of keeping children entertained as they were walking around with their parents who were shopping. And they had this fun uh, gaming catch the monsters idea as they're walking around the retail store so it's a way to stop the children screaming and crying as they were as the mums and dads were shopping uh which has a huge benefit in the world of retail because of course if the parents aren't stressed they might buy more things in the store um so it's a really cool idea um and just the final thing for me i just wanted to show you a few other things that that um in my role at Genesis at the time, we, we explored using AR and VR for. Um, so uh, there's a few examples here. Um, interactive tour guide, the ability to walk around a, a cruise ship in this case uh, from your living room and actually 
have a look at the cabin, see the view from the balcony that you might the cabin you might be interested in um in 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 booking. Uh, have a look around some of the locations that the cruise ship stops at. So that was all built in in AR, and and uh, we we demonstrated that to to customers, uh, and helping customers fill out forms. So as a form filler, so there'll be an overlay on a form, and um, a paper form, and you would just point your phone at the form, and then information about the the fields that you need to write in or, or type into would appear augmented around the form. So it would help people basically fill out forms, um, and that was a re- one use case we thought of for that was was of course um, people who whose English language was a sec was a second or third or language or they didn't speak English at all. It could really help them, for example, translate forms uh, if they're filling out tax returns and stuff like that. Um, so um, that's it from me. Uh, thank you for your time, um, and uh, we are you know, coping to continue the work with Coventry, and we are continuing to work with Coventry um, in their fabulous new building, which is really, really wonderful. Um, and I think I'm right in saying, Bianca, that the reason it's called, it, it's named after Delia Derbyshire, for those of you who, yes. who don't know, um, there is a reason for this, and she's quite a very famous person in this country, isn't she? Um, Absolutely. A pioneer of her time, yeah. Definitely, and, and that ethos underpins what we do. Um, thank you very much, Simon. Um, so I, I'm going to sort of wrap things up a little bit and hope that we still have some time for Q&A. We should do, I think, uh, Bram and Magdalena. Um, so as I said, there's different ways in which we work together with industry and we're really trying to ensure that um, what we're doing is all about that future workforce. We believe very much that education uh, needs to prepare students in different ways. And if we're talking about simulation in the context of extended reality, um, as Sean said earlier, it's not just uh, technologically enabled um, or supported simulation. It's about that whole learning experience uh, for students and finding different ways to embed industry practice and industry collaboration in different parts of um, our work. Um, But of course, what we do is not only about working with students, we're also very much uh, looking at uh, research and uh, enterprise and innovation opportunities to collaborate um, with people. So this particular project was an Arts Council England funded project, um, which was called 5G Creative Explorer. And uh, this project brought together creative arts organizations, they may be in performance, um, they might be uh, museums or heritage cultural organizations um, that we worked with, they might already be experimenting with emerging and new technologies, Um, but we brought together this this cohort of um, local arts organizations to explore the possibilities of 5G. And uh, I think this really, sort of reflects back on what Sean said at the beginning about the fact that it's not about necessarily specific technologies. We speak about immersive, but we're also very much aware that AR, VR, XR, uh, there are a range of technologies that can support, extend, augment, enhance, and change the way that we use those things. And 5G is one area that uh, we were looking at. So these arts organizations had the opportunity to uh, work through intensive workshops um, to be uh, funded uh, for their time in developing some prototypes to look at what 5G could do for them. And we had some really interesting projects around audience interaction, around content production, around XR, virtual design and performance in the context of uh, 5G. So that's another way in which we have worked. Um, In terms of our research, we have a number of research projects that have focused on what simulation uh, looks like in our various uh, research centers. So viral, uh, which is an unfortunate acronym in the post-COVID era, but at the time <laughs> uh, was was a, a little bit less um, sensitive. Virtual reality archive learning was an R&D uh, project that was funded uh, with uh, Horizon 2020, no, uh, EU funding. Uh, to create a new adult education program using VR and augmented reality. And so the idea was working with partners in Europe. Um, We tried to, uh, well, we adapted a train-the-trainer kind of model where we would bring 
uh, young adults in uh, to train them in AR and VR. We would create a sort of uh, not a guidebook, but a sort of uh, tutorial system that would lead them through various experimentations with 360 video, with virtual reality, with augmented reality. We had online workshops. And then the idea was that they would go to uh, urban environments, uh, capture that and bring back um, those things. And so that was a research project that uh, was uh, very much about working differently with partners and finding ways to increase capacity in the immersive ecosystem. Um, and then just to highlight it, another way that we work with industry is co-development of courses. Um, and so we have a new master's course in game studio development, which was co-developed with a partner, an industry partner, UGLA, um, which is a distributed games company, meaning they don't have a physical premises, but are primarily located in Leamington Spa, which is really near um, to Coventry, uh, that Silicon Spa area, very much known for games. Um, and they approached us uh, because they're really interested in that gap in in uh, talent, um, what Simon was referencing earlier, the need for industry to recruit talented young people who understand these new and emerging technologies, but more than that, are able to adapt to this rapidly changing environment um, and to work in different contexts. And so in particular, we were focusing on how do we uh, equip our students with the skills and the expertise to deal with a rapidly changing environment, but also to do that in the context of smaller businesses. Obviously, uh, for a lot of large games publishers uh, and developers, they snap up the talent really quickly, which means that smaller studios, indies, um, and smaller studios quite often uh, struggle to find multi-skilled uh, talent that can come in and, and bring that through. So um, that approach is very much about not a traditional kind of master's uh, program, but very much one that is all about emulating the studio experience. So working with the game studio uh, to bring in industry input, to have that kind of mentorship available to students, but also to get them into a studio um, uh, style environment so that when they are leaving the university, once they've graduated, they are equipped with what's needed to fill those gaps. And of course, the studio model is something that um, in, in the arts, in art and design in particular, is not something new to us, but something that we're looking to move into with uh, a lot of our courses in creative technologies, which is one of our new clusters. Um, and then just to highlight one more um, example, uh, XRL was Extended Reality Leadership Training. This was a research project, but also um, broader projects that were related to this was examining how we can use simulation and training, uh, particularly in VR, uh, but also in AR and face-to-face, -to, -face, to do some of those things that quite often referred to as soft skills training, not a term that I'm particularly fond of, but the idea of how do we create uh, simulations to allow people to engage with different scenarios um, and, and to learn from those situations. So an example, not from this particular project, but from another one uh, that I worked with was to look at microaggressions um, and unconscious bias and to present different situations in VR that uh, participants could react to, interact with, and shoot, make different choices at different points as part of their learning. Um, uh, one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is how do we make visible the thought processes of people that are in training, whether they are within sort of so-called formal education uh, courses or if it's more informal learning. So that idea of we send a student out to go and do something and we're not with them when they're making the choices that they make, how do we make that visible? Um, and I think there's a really interesting aspect to XR and to that kind of simulation work that would allow us to uh, experiment with, with visibility of that process in, in that particular way. Um, so the immersive ec ecosystem that we are building at uh, the Faculty of Arts at Coventry University is about seamlessness. We are very much aware that uh, these technological uh, platforms 
don't always allow that seamless integration. But what we're looking for is an experience for our students that's really 360 by 360 immersion. So uh, not an either or, not what we saw during COVID, which was a hybrid um, that didn't work for all students at all times, uh, but something that was a little bit uh, different. Um, and so we have had that investment in physical and virtual infrastructure, as we've already discussed, we are examining new ways of working with a new working group to think about how we collaboratively work across these areas. Um, and we are looking at uh, the word that uh, Sean um, intimated earlier that I like to use, digital, uh, physical digital engagement that spans and merges and blurs those boundaries. Because I think um, if COVID taught us anything, uh, it's that we need to change the way that we orient ourselves um, when we think about the division between digital and physical. Um, and that's what the new spaces are about in Delia Derbyshire. It's about what our immersive strategy is all about. It's getting to grips with those changes and reconfiguring what we do uh, and how we do it. Um, and I'm just going to, conscious of time, um, skip through that and just say we really do want to invite anybody who's interested in talking to us about the possibilities, not only of the spaces that we've highlighted, but also the, most importantly, the ways of working that we've highlighted to get in touch. My contact details and Sean's are on the screen and um, you can, I'll just give it a moment. So if you want to uh, take a picture of that, you can, it will obviously be in the recording. Um, but also I know that both Simon and Gren um, are very interested in having opportunities to discuss possibilities and to think about different ways of working and collaboration. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, see, I don't know, uh, Bram Magdalena, do we have some time for questions? Thank you so much, Bianca, Sean, and guests. Gran, Simon, um, Gran, I owe, I owe a little apology to you because as I think I posted all the URLs in, in the chat, but I couldn't find Wireframe that quickly. So I'm, I'm very happy to see it on the slides, wireframexr.com. Um, didn't want to leave you out there. Uh, we have one burning question. That's about the inclusion and accessibility of the technology and the spaces. Um, can you share a bit more about the approaches that you used? And I do believe Elegantly, perhaps I want to slip in uh, something from the EBM perspective as well. In terms of inclusion and access accessibility, do you collaborate as well with, with smaller parties on, on, on short term projects, for example, except for only the large size corporations or designing um, a new curricula, etc.? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll kick off with a little bit of that answer, Bren. I mean, at one level, the whole question of accessibility is very front and centre for us as an educational institution. So part of the answer is that we have, a, if you like, an overlay across everything we do that's about making sure that we are attentive to accessibility. Um, so there are a couple of bits of software that the university uses. There are some protocols and guidelines about how we should approach those questions. So at one level, it applies to everything. Um, that's actually a challenge to implement across multiple platforms, particularly if we're in a kind of experimental phase. Um, but then beyond that, we have very strong um, equality, diversity and inclusion committee, both in faculty and in the university. And we work with them on very specific project areas to work out about how we address specific um, accessibility issues. So perhaps I didn't explain this well enough earlier. One of the uh, ideas around, well, it's a question of what's an external and what's an internal partner. Mm -hmm. So from a faculty point of view, some of the entities that we collaborate with are at university or university group level. So they sort of feel kind of semi-internal, semi-external. So we get challenges from them and we'll work with them on small projects to kind of address accessibility issues. Um, I think that my, from my perspective, the default position is it's just a challenge because in some cases, those platforms come with an accessibility agenda and they've already thought about those uh, issues they are they follow the same kinds of protocols that we as an organization do in some cases they don't think about it and and then we've got to wrap the overlay around it to make sure that we're you know we're meeting our expectations so 
it's quite a complex picture, I think it's fair to say on that, but we try to attach it at a number of levels. And if I can just add to that, I think um, it is something that we see on a practical day to day level working with students because student cohorts um, are very diverse. Um, they have different needs and different um, uh, challenges that they might be faced with at a particular time. So you bring a set of headsets in, VR headsets, um, whatever kind it is. And, and some students really struggle with the idea of having a headset on, for example. Um, I, I had a, a student fairly recently who had 50% vision in one eye really struggled with the VR headsets as a result of that. And so it's thinking about ways in which that experience can be accessible to someone who may not be able to access it in headset at that particular moment. So how do we visualize that differently? How do we create a um, an equivalent, and I, I use that word with hesitation because I always think when we say something is equivalent, the reality is it, it doesn't always meet that standard of equivalence, um, but at least to try and address that and make it more accessible. For example, being able to cast what's happening in headset onto another screen to allow somebody who can't, for whatever reason, use a headset um, to, to still be part of that particular experience. It's not an ideal thing, as, as Sean has said. Um, we're still working through that, but it's something um, we're all very passionate about. And um, um, so I, I'm also recently moved into the position of, of co-chair of the Metaverse for Good Committee uh, for the VRAR Association. And we're also collaborating with the Committee for Diversity and Inclusion um, for that international organization. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a question that's being asked across uh, the industry in different ways. Um, so I think it's a very broad discussion and um, uh, one that we don't have a nice easy answer to, but uh, something that's important to uh, us to consider. And, and just seeing the question in the chat, I mean, I'll say something about the spaces, which is that the university is bound by a very strong set of protocols around accessibility in the in the spaces. So um, all the spaces are designed with, with accessibility in mind in terms of um the flooring the graphics that we use for signage um intersections between floors and walls and thinking about the color contrasts accessibility through the front of the building um lifts internal lifts so all of those things are very much woven into so whilst whilst the development was a mix of new build and um, ex a refurb of an existing build, the refurb was back to concrete. So it was as if we were building a new building. So um, the, the whole space meets the, the current UK highest standards for accessibility. But I think the technologies is the more complex picture than, than, the, than the building. And I think for us, it's also emerging as we experiment because we're trying different things with different groups of students. Um, and I do think that's the benefit of a, of a university space or an educational space is that we can try things, get feedback, try it again in a different way and see what works. And, and it's very much a sort of test and try mm. and, and try again. And just to give one last instance, um, some of our humanities colleagues are running a project which they call, they're calling Pardon Me which sorry probably doesn't translate from some european colleagues but it's you know it's to say i didn't quite hear you so it's a it's a play on words for a project that's about people with hearing impairments and how we do audio transcription and which audio transcription systems work and which don't so they're trialing a number of them and working with a number of colleagues on different courses to see um, from a user point of view, um, which of those systems actually works well. Which really ties into a, a use case that's that's emerging um, as we speak, you know, we, we use all these terms, metaverse, etc. But one of the augmented reality use cases or mixed reality use cases that I've seen recently is live transcription using um, glasses. And, and I think, you know, for me, that's a really exciting possibility. You are wearing glasses like I am now. And um, those of us, I, I have hearing issues um, and quite often use subtitles to understand um, and I read lips more than I realize I do uh, but to have that ability to actually have live transcription um, would be an amazing sort of inclusive use case um, for this kind of technology so I think there's experimentation also in the broader industry uh, but in terms of our approach it, it it has very much been about ensuring that we meet those guidelines, but also experimenting with what the technology can do and how our very different groups of students um, engage with it.
Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Celine, John, uh, it answers your question here. Yeah, I see a nodding hand, somebody happy and data. Feel free to follow up with Bianca and Sean of uh, bilaterally, of course. Um, from my and EBN side, uh, thank you, all guests. Thank you for participating. Thank you for the presentation. It's time to wrap up. Um, the recording of the session will be available, I think, within one or two weeks. It might have a bit of a processing delay than, than usual. Um, Magdalena. We like to close it off. Yes, thank you very much, Bram. Thank you very much, all the speakers, Bianca and Sean, uh, Simon and Gren. Excellent presentations, very inspiring, and I hope that all uh, over fifty participants of this of this webinar have been as, as inspired as I myself. Even working at Coventry, I always love to hear about all these um, fantastic de developments and and evolutions, and being so happy to visit the new building that we have in Coventry campus. So we would like to invite you to our next webinar, which will be on the 1st of March uh, regarding then healthcare um, applications of, of the experiential technologies. So thank you very much. And we wish you a very nice um, end of the day, a nice evening. See you next time and follow us on our social media and on our websites. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.